out there. It's, uh, it's always a good conference when you have a, a raucous uh, dialogue in the coffee group. So I, I think we've uh, achieved that level of success early today. So um, we have three presenters uh, coming up now in the program. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, each of them now. You can hold your applause to the end, and then um, we'll get underway with Dr. Paul Misner. So uh, starting with Dr. Misner, uh, Paul was born in Akron, Ohio in 1936. When he was six years old, the family moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, where he was brought up. After seminary training and advanced studies in Rome and Munich, uh, he was awarded the Doctor of Theology in 1969. He taught at Boston College and then at Marquette University in Milwaukee from 1979 to 2002. His dissertation on John Henry Newman in Vatican I uh, was published in 1976, followed by two volumes on social Catholicism in modern Europe. Uh, in 1991 and 2015, and they're right there. <laughs> both, uh, both of his books are on our website under um, bibliography. And so while working on the second of these two volumes, the one he just showed, uh, he of course treated, among other social Catholic pioneers, Joseph Cardine, and also discovered Henry Holt, and I may have mispronounced that because he's new to me, so I'm really looking forward to Paul's talk to to learn more about this figure, and that's going to be the focus of his presentation today. Now, following uh, Dr. Paul Misner, we'll have uh, Dr. Claire Adams. Uh, Madonna Claire Adams, uh, PhD, is retired from Caldwell University in New Jersey. Uh, she was a member of the Department of Theology and Philosophy, and she holds degrees from the School of Philosophy and Catholic University at Yale Divinity School. She is the former director of the Center for Applied Ethics at Pace University and a Liberty Partnership program for at-risk youth in New York. Her areas of interest in publication include the human person, Greek philosophy, environmental ethics, and the philosophy of Maria Montessori, which is very interesting, and uh, Paracotri. So a current, she's a current ESL <coughs> tutor and chaplain volunteer in Whittier, California, and she'll be presenting second. She'll also be doing a workshop later today that I'm very much interested in myself um, see Judge Act on the human person. And um, last on our panel today we have Dr. David Lutz. He is a professor of philosophy and dean of faculty at Holy Cross College, Notre Dame, Indiana. He received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame and taught in Africa, in Nigeria, Uganda, and Kenya for a decade, where he co-edited six books in collaboration with African colleagues. His publications include Ex Corde Ecclesia and Business Education, Faith and Reason, African Ubuntu Philosophy and Global Management, in the Journal of Business Ethics, and The Virtues and the Subjective Meaning of Work in Oconomia. He and his wife Amelia have two daughters, Catherine and Isabella, and he entered the Catholic Church in the Jubilee year 2000 and subsequently became a lay Dominican. So we have uh, an outstanding uh, group up here to share a wealth of their knowledge, and I'm sure we're all going to be taking notes uh, feverishly. But first, uh, Paul Misner, we welcome you to Mount St. Joseph University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, enough introductions. We're doing a little history this, this morning. I think that we're first up because of chronological order, is it? Uh, anyway, there's the title, Joseph Cardine and Henry Pulse. The name is pronounced Pulse, Dutchman. Uh, subtitle, Lowland Contemporaries and Apostles of Working Class Catholics. So what kind of voice were Catholic workers to have in society and in the church a century ago? Joseph Cardine and Henry Post faced this challenge of priests in roughly the same time in neighboring countries but in starkly different circumstances. In Belgium, Cardine founded the Young Christian Workers of Josephs, as you all know, <coughs> whereas in the Netherlands, Pulse aimed at something called Stance Organisasi, or Milieu Organization, for all, all Catholic workers, alongside labor, labor unions proper, which were Christian in the Netherlands, as 
on the one hand, socialists on the other. And uh, allied to his movement was a, a youth contingent called the Young of Ackermann. Now, when Pius XI, Pope from 1922 to 1939, established Catholic action as the model of organized apostolic activity for lay Catholics, both the model of Pulse, the new organization, and Cardine's Young Christian Worker, JOC model, were faced with an internal Catholic brand question of how their work might fit into the now official papal model for lay Catholic action. The Catholic action was originally framed with Italy in mind, did not make allowances for different levels of wealth or social placement, just for groupings by gender, male or female, and age, youth and adult. A distinction by different social classes seem to be asking for trouble and strife. After all, one wondered how could an official Catholic program be distinguished by social class, the working class, and not be con suspected of contamination with anti-clerical socialism and class envy. By the way, am I audible enough? Yes. yes. Joseph Cardin, Henry Pulse. Uh, a few comparisons to serve as introductions. Cardin was born in 1882 in Brussels, Belgium. He was the son of a local small-scale dealer in coal. Henry Pulse saw the light of day 14 years earlier, in 1868, some 75 miles to the northeast in Dutch Limburg in a town called Fenrai, where his father was a prosperous sheep trader. Sheep farmer and trader. By the time Josef Cardine was ordained a priest while at the University of Louvain, Leuven, 1906, Pulse had a doctorate from the same university with a dissertation on the Pentateuch, 1897. And happened to be teaching at the Catholic University of Washington as professor of Old Testament, our Catholic University. Now, this is, uh, this is the puzzle here. The two pioneers in neighboring countries <coughs> seem to have had virtually no contact with one another through the 20s and 30s. How could that be? Well, that's why I'm bringing Pulse into a Cardine conference, because I would like to bring out why that must have been, and we just don't have the records. Uh, neither Cardine nor Pulse ever made this connection explicitly that we know of. When the biographer of Henry Pulse, uh, his biography is just called Pulse, 1985 in Dutch. When he was putting the finishing touches on that work, he was reading an article on the priest worker controversy in the French Jesuit quarterly Etudes. He came across the surprising observation. And I'm going to quote from the editor's article in this December 1953 issue of Etude, uh, Jean Villon is the Jesuit editor's name, to quote, Should one wish to identify the actual initiator of the modern labor apostolate, one would need to have recourse to Monsignor Cardine, the creator of the JOC. And he would no doubt, here's the surprising thing, send us back to the man that inspired his own thought, to that amazing Monsignor Pulse, the founder of the Workers' Milieu Organization in Dutch Limburg, some 50 years ago. 
end of the quote. So, the biographer, Father Coulson himself, was surprised to see this connection made. He had immersed himself, he was a co-worker of Coulson's, he had immersed himself in all the printed literature, and yet he was surprised to find this connection made by a, an esteemed French Jesuit. It is worth noting that the two priests grew up speaking the same language at home, Flemish, Dutch. This may be one reason why Cardine was assigned to the parish of Lachen in the Brussels area in 1912. He could converse with the ordinary people of the parish in Flemish, unlike the priests from the Walloon part of Belgium. Back in the Netherlands, in his Diocese of Roermond, Pulse was back in the Netherlands, we'll find out why shortly, uh, the bishop named Pulse to be pastor of a little church, and also the diocesan chaplain of social works. And this is what opened up the mission that will occupy our attention as the main focus of this paper. While Pulse was occupied with the coal mining that was new to Limburg in the Netherlands, and with the situation of the miners, World War I took place. The Netherlands remained neutral, meaning that no invasion took place and mining went on undisturbed, indeed intensified. When World War I broke out, on the other hand, in Belgium, uh, the Germans invaded Belgium because it was the best route into France. Getting around the defensive fortifications that the French had built on their own work. So the Belgian Cardinal Archbishop of Mechelen, Maline, Desiree Joseph Mercier, had just appointed Cardine as head of the Catholic Social Works of the Brussels area. Okay, first, first real connection, first real comparison. Uh, here one can see the first close parallel. The most striking difference between the two of them, Pouls and Cardine, was of course the fact that Cardine spent seven months in prison in 1917 for his resistance to the German occupation. After a brief release, he was back in prison. He had a long sentence, but it was commuted after a shorter period because World War I came to an end with the November 1918 armistice. Picking up the pieces of his lay apostolate among the workers was not easy, as you probably, many of you know, quite well. But he had a remarkable response and uh, eventually uh, played a very active role in the young Christian <coughs> workers. Uh, eventually even at Vatican II, as Stefan Gigach is about, is, would tell us if he were here. Uh, and as we've already heard of it, this morning from Joe Holland. Uh, so he died, Cardinal died in 1967, 50 years ago, at the age of 84. Back to Pouls, during World War I, he did not suffer from pleurisy, as Cardinal had, nor imprisonment, or the trials of foreign occupation. Towards the end of his life, late 30s, 40s, he did suffer heart problems requiring him to retire. Then, with the advent of World War II and the May 1940 German invasion of the Netherlands, he was able to recuperate in Switzerland after an adventurous trek managed by his nephews to escape from the occupying forces. While there, he managed to write some memoirs and uh, returned from exile in Switzerland in 1945, dying at the age of 80 in 1948. So he died 20 years before Cardinal did. And uh, let me explain that on his way out 
he destroyed all his correspondence. Because he was going to be arrested and the Nazis were interested in his, his anti-Nazi colleagues. Uh, I would suppose that there's some correspondence between him and Cartwright, but it's all gone. So now I have to explain Holster's uh, milieu organization. And I have about five minutes, so let's see what I can do here. Uh, well, he got this appointment due to another priest who was a politician in the Netherlands back in 1912, 10, when he was just back in, in Holland. And this priest politician persuaded his bishop, who didn't know what to do with this Bible scholar, to make him chaplain of social works. Okay. He found uh, several connections. He made you know, attack this idea very quickly. Who can I find to help with social works in, uh, in Vermont? And he found a, a man called Henry Hermann. Uh, a lay person who had been interested in Rerum Navarum since 1891. And he was a journalist and writer. And now I will quote uh, one lengthy citation from a book in English by a Dutch historian who highlights Pulse's uh, activity and significance for Catholicism in the Netherlands. So starting in 1910, he's back in Limburg. I quote, uh, and by the way, when we get to this passage, the author, E. H. Kosman, The Low Countries, that's the name of his book, translated into English, he talks about a class organization. And we'll then explain why we call it a milieu organization. We'll get to that. Quote Another center of Catholic action against the propaganda of socialism was Limburg, where a new industrial proletariat was created in the space of a couple of years by the expansion of the mining industry. Here it was the priest H. A. Puls, hailing from this province, who led and justified the movement. Pulse was a robust fighter who sought rather than evaded conflict. Pulse gave the impression of belonging to the type of the merry, corpulent priest from the South, as opposed to the more ascetic, somewhat pietistic type characteristic of the northern part of the Netherlands. And of course, the Netherlands was dominantly Protestant, too. I can't get into that. Back to the quote. After a tumultuous career as a scholar which ended in disaster because his biblical criticism met with too much resistance in Rome, in 1910, Pulse was appointed priest to a small Limburg village. There he found a Catholic organization already in existence, but much still needed to be done. This is Henry Herman's organization. Oh, and a, a German model Christian interconfessional minor tune, where he met the, the leader of that. Uh, Pulse wanted two things. First, he wanted an anti-socialist national, he wanted anti-socialist national trade unions, which would fight for the workers' material interests without the intervention of the clergy. Secondly, he wanted and got Catholic class organizations organizations of the Catholic population in local or diocesan clubs divided according to the different social classes. These were to be under the leadership of priests and subordinate to the episcopacy. The clubs for the workers <clears throat> would of course be the most substantial and most important. In such clubs, Pulse saw the opportunity for the thorough reformation of the human soul, for that change of consciousness, for that reconversion by which the world could be saved. Pulse and his men, men might almost be said to occupy in Catholicism the place which 
the left-wing Marxist occupied in socialism. Of course, they, Pulse's men wanted, first of all, to alleviate the distress in which the workers found themselves. Their inspiration, however, was the conviction that through propaganda and instruction in the strong framework of organization, it would be possible to bring about the much more essential work of spiritual reform. Before 1914, Pulse's ideas met with no great success. After the war, however, his conception was exported to Belgium and Germany as the Dutch contribution to Catholic social doctrine. Again, the idea appeared difficult to realize. End of quote. Okay. Uh, Pulse calls them class organizations. Uh, that's a translation of the Dutch stance, organisasi, which I'll have to repeat several times. And we now translate that as milieu organizations. How did that come about? Well, the Dutch language has the same word for class as the rest of our languages, klasse. But uh, Hermans and Pulse avoided it because the socialists had taken control of it. And, but they had this other convenient term, stan, stan, or, or estate would be an old-fashioned uh, translation in English, or etat in French. But it doesn't translate class organization very well either, so the French immediately in Belgium uh, translated it as milieu, milieu, organisation de milieu. And that's what we took over in English. Okay, so Stats Organisasi was the name that Henry Hermans had already used for his version of the same idea. Now, in that passage I just read from Kosman, he refers to Stats Organisasi as to be under the leadership of priests and to be subordinate to the episcopacy. I have to add a nuance there. Bishops and clericalists in the Catholic Limburg may well have thought of it in these terms. However, Pulse stressed the autonomous initiative of the lay members. He coined, coined another Dutch saying that I must uh, translate, that I must give you in Dutch. He said, our organizations are Catholic, to be sure, but not carefully. Mm -hmm. They were churchly, but not run by clerics. <laughs> so, uh, what was really behind this? Well, obviously, the idea of, uh, of uh, lay leadership, lay collaboration, to say the least. Uh, and he ran into problems right there in Limburg with this focus because there were already, especially in other parts of the Netherlands, there were already Catholic labor unions. And uh, a leading politician from, from the province of South Holland had founded in 1906 already Catholic Social Action. That's what he called it in Dutch. And so, uh, the, uh, this idea of Hermann's and Pulse of a set of labor unions, but beside that, a, a broader Catholic workers organization ran into opposition. The unions were afraid they'd have to pay dues to this other organization. And that's what Hermans actually had, had suggested, uh, raised their, raise their uh, opposition. And they, they, they appealed to the bishops. The bishops, five bishops in the Netherlands, played quite a leading role in the Catholic Church. There was, as I said, a minority in, in the Netherlands. But the, uh, the Catholic, Union Confederation put out a 
response to the fact that we are the stance organization of Catholic workers. We're here already, we don't need another one. Well, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, and Paul's appeal to the bishops, and they met in 1916. In 1915 already, uh, Hermann's got the bishops to appeal to the, oh my, uh, <laughs> to the uh, five priestly chaplains of social works in the dioceses. And they each, each, they each submitted a, a rapport. And when the uh, uh, agenda for the bishops' meeting of the whole country came out, Bols was amazed to see that his rapport, that he had submitted the previous year, was quoted in extenso, without any attribution, of course. But there it was, word for word. And what he explained was how workers live in a different milieu, uh, constitute a different social stand than other Catholics, and they need a, an apostolic approach geared to their own stand. And the bishops adopted that and came out with the 1916 declaration that, yep, the stance organization has to come. It has to be for everybody and labor unions, of course, for uh, people who can join them. Uh, and that, that problem went on, and the controversy went on until 1925, when finally the bishops again came uh, to the conclusion <coughs> that uh, the two organizations, the P Labor Federation and the Stance Organization, had been organized nationally together under a, under a single head who turned out to be a lay person. And that continued very successfully for the 20s and 30s. Uh, I, I think I've got to leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>